we spend a lot of our time when we talk to someone who's struggling, coaching them on how to be better and saying like, here, let me put my arm around you and give you some advice. Um, and that's actually pretty demoralizing because if you've ever been on the receiving end, it's like, oh, you think I'm such a doofus that I've never thought of this before. And you're telling me and you're two seconds off the top of your mind, this problem that I've been struggling with, how you would approach it if you were me. So it's demoralizing. And often they kind of know already how to go about doing it. So she thought, what if we flip the script? What if instead of giving people advice, we actually asked people who were trying to achieve more if they could coach someone else. And maybe that would actually be really effective because maybe it would boost their confidence. Suddenly they'd realize um, somebody's looking up to me and thinks I know what I'm talking about. So anyone who's struggling with that confidence obstacle might suddenly feel, okay, maybe I've got what it takes. And maybe they'd also introspect and think about things that would work for them and then describe those. And they might not uh, might dredge up insights they wouldn't have otherwise. And finally, maybe they would uh, feel funny telling someone else to do something and not doing it themselves. Because after you've, you've said something, like it's going to be kind of hip- hypocritical if you don't walk the talk. I'm Katie Milkman, and I'm a professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm also the author of the new book, How to Change, The Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. And I'm excited to be joining you on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with the amazing author, Katie Milkman. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? (laughs) I'm the luckiest person in the world. (laughs) That's a short answer. Um, But a longer answer is that um, I thought I was going to be maybe an investment banker or a consultant. I was sort of quantitatively inclined in college and a lot of the people in my major. I was an engineer, but an operations research and financial uh, engineer at Princeton. A lot of folks in in that major ended up in consulting or investment banking. Um, And then I got my hooks in research. And when I was a junior in college, I did a little bit of research and I was just so into it. By my senior year, I discovered um, the magic of it when I did a thesis that was required. And for my senior thesis, I analyzed a decade of New Yorker short stories to try to figure out whether or not um, stories were actually about characters who resembled their authors and whether or not editorial shifts at the magazine changed the type of fiction they published. And it was so exciting. I just loved everything about crunching the data, knowing the answer to these questions I was intrigued about before anyone else in the world. And I decided to pursue a PhD. uh, And then sort of the rest was just a trajectory that it set me on to become an academic. And I feel so lucky that I have the the amazing job I do and I get to wake up every day and answer questions with data and talk to brilliant people and um, share my findings with students and reporters. And it's just the best job. That's pretty cool. Uh, did some of your findings include the writing of Malcolm Gladwell? You know, uh, he's not a fiction writer, so I was focused on fiction writers, but I did discover Malcolm Gladwell in part through The New Yorker and enjoyed uh, his work immensely. And You know, I'm a huge fan of the many great translators of social science and giving giving it a shot on my own now with this book. Yeah, I was just curious because I had Malcolm on uh, just a couple of days ago, so that was, uh, it's fresh in my mind. Let's go back in the chronology if we can. I like to do this and I, I like to ask people... Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? What were you thinking about? What was young Katie thinking about? Um, I, I'm curious about this because I, I know a lot of people, uh, and, I, and I do like to oversimplify this particular piece because uh, if you're young, um, you're coming out of school and trying to figure out what to do with your life. If you are maybe mid-career and the pandemic has punched you in the mouth, you're making a reset and you're taking inventory and you're trying to figure out what's my next move. Um, and I'm curious about signals and uh, if you got any from an early age or if you had sp- specific direction from your parents, what did that look like? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I did not want to be an academic. That didn't. That was not on my list because I didn't really understand what the job was. I assumed it had to do with teaching. And while I love teaching, I didn't have an itch to teach as a kid. I was more, I really wanted to make sure that I was doing something um, that involved as much of my intellect as possible. And I was, I didn't appreciate that teaching would be 
so intellectually stimulating as it is. Um, when I was really young, I thought I wanted to be a brain surgeon. <laughs> and I think that came from, you know, like my parents romanticizing this this field of like really smart people doing really hard work that saved lives. And so it had lots of things that were appealing to me. I like the idea of making a contribution that was positive to other people, that it was hard and challenging and people looked up to brain surgeons. And so that was sort of like my little kid dream. And then I think I just got confused once I started to understand better what careers looked like. And, and I, I thought like something with numbers, I like math, something with numbers that I can do well and I'll try to figure it out. And then in college, that's when I discovered how much I loved research and, and took the path I did. So you mentioned Princeton. Are you from the East Coast? I am. I grew up in Washington, D.C., in the suburbs. The suburbs. Okay. And what did your parents do? Um, my dad ran a small economic consulting agency actually out of our basement. And my mom was a senior executive in the government and the, um, a, a civil servant. Okay. So... I mean, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. You know, you had parents with, with brains, and so are you, are you an only child, or do you have do you have siblings? A half brother who was eighteen years older than I was, so we didn't grow up together. So probably closer to an only child. Um, if you if you have to give a formal definition, <laughs> then yeah. Well, I'm doing my own sort of pseudo psychoanalysis right now as I'm thinking about. So I have kids too, you know, and it's easy for me as a parent because um, we have a we have four children. But our our last child, although planned, there's a like a ten year gap between uh, his uh, sister and there's like a fifteen year gap between his brother. Anyway, so he's sort of like an only child and uh, with lots of parents. He has lots of parents. <laughs> yeah, he has lots of parents, and he's like like he's being. Um, I don't want to say like uh, prepared, but like, you know, we, we all have high expectations for him. He's uh, the golden child in many ways. Um, anyway, we have, we have high hopes that he's going to be amazing uh, and he will in his own way. All of your kids will be amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, although, you know, it is easy for parents now. It's f easy for me to say that obviously the first one and two were sort of the guinea pigs or the experiments where we tried lots of stuff. And now that we have more wisdom, um, the, the last two are benefiting from that for sure, without question. And more patience. <laughs> I have a five-year-old, so I, I can imagine how, you know, that experience would, would help you grow as a parent. Yes, yes. Yeah, the five-second rule when food falls on the ground is much longer. It's more like a 25-second rule and things like that, but yeah. Uh, so that's excellent. Okay, so your your parents, uh, did they give you, like, any direction? Did they steer you in one particular way? Did they say, we, you know, brain surgeon sounds great, keep that up, or you should try music, or? Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting. Um, they definitely wanted me to do something that used uh, my my skills in math. So I was very good at math from a young age. I mean, not very good. I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't a prodigy, but like, you know, I tested well in math. And um, my dad's father had been a mathematician. So there was a, rom you know, a romance with numbers and a belief that that was a really important set of skills. They were excited about that. They thought a woman pursuing something mathematical would be great. My half brother had um, chosen to be a musician and had had a tough time. It's a tough field. And I think that they wanted to see me do something practical that I loved and where it would be easier to find a job. So I would say that that was as much direction probably as they gave me. Um, but that's a lot of direction. And then they were supportive of lots of different possibilities and wanted me to explore and figure out what I liked. So you, you were sort of heading towards engineering as well at one point. So how did you choose? I guess let's distill some wisdom for people who are, are trying to figure out what they should do. Did you have signals um, you knew that you were good with, with numbers. So, you know, when something comes easy for you, you tend to like it, I think, more. Not necessarily all the time, but most of the time. Um, but how did you know, okay, not medicine, maybe more engineering? How did you make that pivot? Oh, gosh, it's such a good question. And by the way, I think it's hilarious that you're holding me up as if I could be an example, because I think my path was very winding to finding, um, I mean, 
it, it might look like it wasn't, but like most people, I think I stumbled a lot before I found my way. So I entered Princeton thinking I would maybe major in economics. I was a Bachelor of Arts student. Um, I hated the first course I took in economics with a passion, which is funny because now I'm probably the closest field um, to what I do is economics. I'm not, I'm sort of in a between field in behavioral science. Anyway, hated it. I just thought it was garbage. I, I had a professor who read from a textbook when um, lecturing. That was literally the experience. So the teaching quality was awful. And then um, I also just didn't buy the, the basic assumptions of the field that people are optimal decision makers and perfectly rational. And I just, you know, I looked around at my life, my roommates, my friends on the tennis team. And I was like, which of us is optimizing? Are you kidding me? <laughs> that is not what my, I'm seeing. So um, between the terrible teaching quality and the assumptions I couldn't wrap my head around, I decided I had to get out. Um, and I actually decided to go to summer school so I could switch and become an engineer. And the reason I settled on engineering was that I had a roommate who was an engineer and I was sort of looking over her shoulder at the course catalog and thinking, wow, this looks really interesting and useful. She was taking classes on things like transportation systems and e-commerce. And I was like, that I, I could be really interested in that. She's taking computer programming. So um, I decided to copy what she was doing and I went to summer school, switched and became an engineer. And then of course, now I'm, I'm a behavioral scientist more somewhere in between economics and psychology, but it took me until graduate school in engineering to find my way back to what it turns out I love. Okay, but maybe here's the lesson, right? So a, a lot of us, especially those who are perfectionists or you know have those tendencies, or we want to have it all figured out in advance, we don't like uncertainty, um, the message continues to be, and this is a theme I would say 100% of the time that I talk to uh, smart people who are successful, or at least doing what they love, um, it is not a straight line from A to B or C to D or to Z. Um, you had to try on several things to see if they fit. And at first they didn't. And then alas, you sort of came back full circle, which is another lesson, which is uh, remember that sometimes, you know, it's about timing or it's about people or about, you know, um, whatever the circumstance. So it reminds me of uh, a lesson I've learned several times, which is just because you failed today doesn't mean you're going to fail tomorrow. The opposite is true. Just because you succeeded this time doesn't mean your next project's going to succeed. Nothing is guaranteed like that. And so it's great to hear that you recognize that it was just the teacher, not the particular subject that you hated as much. Uh, it seems like you give it another shot. And then that helped you pivot and really find your stride. Absolutely. And I, I do think so much of, well, I mean, there's there's a lot of luck in life, um, but there's also a lot of power in making your own luck by, by exploring. I think too often when I, you know, I'm a college professor now, so I see a lot of undergraduates trying to find themselves. And one of the things that I think is most important is that they explore because sometimes something sounds on paper like it won't be a fit, but then it really can click in a magical way once you get into it. And, and the more you experiment and explore, the more you can discover what makes you tick. And, and you're going to be great at what makes you tick as opposed to, you know, something you're sort of accepting as your path. Yeah, I mean, if, if we haven't overstated it, sometimes this process of elimination, to find out what you don't like doing or what you know doesn't resonate with you or doesn't light you up is just as important as what does, right? Uh, I mean, if you think about medicine, modern medicine, this is the way medicine is done. It's intelligent guessing. Okay, maybe it's not this. Let's try. Okay, you're right. You don't have this. Now let's figure out. A little calibration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a little zing to the medical field, but, um, well, I think most fields, anytime we're trying to solve, a, there's a lot of guess and check and calibrate. Right. Yeah. And, and we're glad that there is, right? Because, um, I was talking to someone the other day who I'm mentoring and, and she's graduating college and I could tell she was looking at me like, wow, you know, I wish I had your experience. And and I just had to stop her and say, okay, so you know that the only way to get experience is by doing stuff and making mistakes. And then those mistakes, if you can learn from them, they become experience. And that, that experience then translates into wisdom. And then when you have wisdom, you can make better choices. But it's just, you know, rinse, wash, rinse, repeat. 
And the only way to get what I've got is just to do the work for 20 years. So um, don't sweat. Sounds like you're a great mentor. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know. I'll let other people be the judge of that. But I, I, th I think what I do have is I have empathy because I, f I remember what it was like, um, and often remember and reminded what it's like to be a new learner, to be a total amateur. Cause I, I'm not someone who, and it's taken some time to get this way, but I don't feel uncomfortable being uncomfortable. I'm willing to put myself out there with the caveat that I can come back and play another day if I fail. I tend not to do stuff that is all your chips in on, you know, 13 black, roll the dice, win or lose. I don't do that. To me, it's too risky. I love that. I also, it makes me think of this study by um, Ting Zhang, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, looking at how valuable it can be to try to empathize with somebody who's a novice when you're experienced and you're trying to coach them and give advice. I love that that's your natural go-to. It's really important. Not everyone does think like that. <laughs> well, and yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, I could go on, but um, I'm curious more about being an academic, um, and let's face it, there's a lot of criticism, uh, and rightly so, towards academics these days because um, a lot of schools or teachers, you know, we're in pursuit of the grade and not pers not particularly focus as much on the learning, perhaps. Um, and we see it, you know, coming out after graduation, getting into the into the work field. It's like all right, you have a lot of book knowledge. You could taste. You're well. You're good at taking tests, but you have no, no real skills. Um, what made you? What was so attractive about teaching and writing and and the research that you're doing now? What is it? What is it about that? Well, the part of academia I'm in is sort of the antithesis of everything you just said, because I work in business academia. And in business schools, our mission is really to be as connected to applied settings as possible while still having a basis in data and science. So I love the part of the ivory tower I'm in because it is so focused on practical problems. And I basically... Um, go and work with companies and try to figure out, you know, there's some problem, there's some challenge, there's some insight they're lacking um, that I think is fundamental and could be broadly applicable. And then I try to solve it scientifically. And then once I have an answer, I get to go back into the classroom and teach my 150 bright Wharton MBA students. This is the way, um, say, you know, to, to build lasting habits. If you have employees you want to encourage to to form healthy habits in the workplace, or if you're trying to promote more productivity in a, a volunteer labor force, this is a strategy you can use that we've scientifically tested that will improve outcomes. So I really enjoy the kind of work I do because it's so applied. And at the same time, we're trying to draw generalizable insights so that we could port, you know, what we learned from working with Google or 24 hour fitness or, um, you know, pick your pick your Walmart and, and say this would work in other organizations too. It's not something really specific about their location or their customers or their employees, um, but, but we're learning an insight about the world and it's a really practical one. So uh, I, I love that aspect of academia. And I, I don't think the students in MBA programs for the most part are chasing grades. They're sort of past that point in their lives. So I'm lucky to be teaching in, in a place where it's really a desire to figure out, can you give me insights that I can take with me when I'm going to be an entrepreneur or a banker or a consultant or um, some other type of organizational leader that I can use? That's what they're looking for and connections and network. So I think I landed in a really lovely part of academia, given my interests. So you've written a book with a title that is potentially polarizing. <laughs> you can you can say lots of different words, but when you say the word change, some of us, I don't know, maybe it's me. I, maybe I should be more self-aware. Change is not easy, right? And not everyone loves change. And But you've written this book, How to Change. You've thrown down the gauntlet. It's like, okay, let's do this. Uh, what, what, what went into, I'm curious about what went into the title? Did you have any consideration for the pushback this might get or, and did you do it on purpose? Um, there was no question that the book was going to be, uh, sort of everything I knew about the science of behavior change. So there were other titles we toyed with like 
change for good or change <laughs> or and then we ended up with how to change but there was no question it was going to be about change because that's what I study and what I felt compelled to write a book about what I felt I could contribute to the world that would be useful um, so I'm not sure any of those alternative titles would have been any less provocative <laughs> and so 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 what uh, what did you learn about change uh, by doing the book like people's apprehension like what prevents people from changing or wanting to change that's such a great question i i and i should say i didn't i, I learned a lot from writing the book about how to tell stories how to communicate um ideas to uh to a, a broad audience rather than an academic audience which is the audience i'm used to talking to um but I, I think really the learning about how to change was the 20 years of research I've done, and then it was synthesized in, in this book. So the key, the key nugget, I'll say, at the heart of the book, it's meant to be sort of an overarching review of everything I know, but the key nugget that holds it all together is uh, the insight that often when people are prescribing strategies, and, and of course there are many books that say they're gonna help you change, there's a focus on a single solution, a, a one size fits all sort of set big audacious goals, visualize success, you know, whatever the, the author's favorite technique is that has some basis in science or not, depending on the author and, and their angle. Um, but too often, I think that that leads to a missed opportunity. So when I've looked at what works in organizations and with individuals who are trying to change, I've found that there actually is rarely a one size fits all solution. And it really, the answer is it depends. And it depends on what the obstacle is that's blocking change. Uh, and in some situations, the obstacle is, you know, oh, I forgot. I like, I don't take my medication every day because I keep forgetting to do it. Um, in some settings, the obstacle is, you know, it's just really dreadful to do the thing I need to do. If it's like a chore to go to the gym, I, I dread it. And so I don't do it. Um, and, you know, there's a long list of different reasons. I'm not confident enough to do it. I don't feel like I have the right impetus to actually get started on this change. All of these different obstacles exist. And whichever one is obstructing progress, you actually need to tailor your solution to that obstacle. And so that's a key lesson at the heart of the book. And then the book breaks down the different obstacles I've seen most frequently and the science that suggests ways we can tackle each one. Uh, and it's not that it's not that like you have only one. Most people have a few things that are probably working against change and they might need a few a recipe that includes a few ingredients but um it tries to be a little bit more sophisticated and and thoughtful about the individual and and hopefully that'll be helpful for lots of readers i mean we were just sitting back you know <laughs> chopping it up reminiscing about the good old days and all that <laughs> you know tracking my roots where i came from and where i'm going but like i say man Always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed with the weather.